and welcome to this, the third meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones and electronic devices are switched off or on silent? Uh, agenda item one is to take um, business in private and to seek members' agreement to take agenda item five, which is consideration of our approach paper to the inquiry. Agreed. And private members agreed. Excellent. Agenda item two is our new inquiry connecting Scotland, how the Scottish Government and its agencies engage internationally. And this morning, we have a very eminent panel. Um, we have the, with us this morning Professor Michael Keating, who is Professor of Politics, University of Aberdeen and Director of the ESRC, Centre on Constitutional Change. Welcome back to the committee. Um, Professor Keating, uh, Dr Daniel Keneally, who is a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh Academy of Government. Uh, welcome back to the committee, Dan, but on the other side of the table this time. Um, we'll be gentle with you, don't worry. <laughs> and we've got Dr Eve Hepburn, who's a Senior Lecturer of Politics and International Relations at the Un University of Edinburgh. And a welcome to the committee for the first time, uh, Eve. But your written submission has gained a wee bit of um, coverage this morning in the, the media. So um, well, well done to that. It always gives a good focus to the committee. But um, delighted to have, have you all here. We weren't going to go with opening statements. Just I'm going to do a general opening question, um, which will, is really just, you know, what, 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 do, what do you see um, as the main drivers um, for uh, sub-state governments um, and international relations and international um, work that they do? Um, if you've got different perspectives on that, we would love to hear it this morning. And just give me a nod who's going to go first, Eve. Yeah, sure. Well, the main drivers of, of external relations of sub-state governments are usually quite functional, um, especially with an emphasis on, on economic relations. So the, the, the primary um, activity of sub-state governments is trying to increase trade and investment, um, foreign investment in the country, um, and, and boost the economy. And there's various ways that sub-state governments have gone about doing that, um, engaging in uh, trade negotiations. Um, Bavaria, the, the land in Germany, has been very successful at doing that and has recently um, finalised some biotechnology trade agreements in, in the, the Far East. So functional considerations are one issue. Um, there are also political considerations as well to try and achieve more representation in international bodies. Um, the European Union, um, UNESCO, the Nordic Council or other areas whereby sub-state regions seek to gain a, a higher political profile for themselves. And something that I've been interested in as well is a kind of an ethical or moral um, aspect of a sub-state government's foreign relations. And it appears that many of the successful strategies adopted by sub-state governments have had an overarching moral dimension to them. Um, for instance, um, the human rights um, dimensions of Catalan and, and the Basque countries' external relations, um, California, um, which seeks to be the moral consciousness um, on environmental matters, and the Oland Islands as well, which have developed a notion of, of being the islands of peace and a model for conflict resolution in the world. <coughs> Professor, Professor Kitty? Well, yeah, well, at the minimum, the aim is to represent the internal competences uh, abroad, so there's a spillover, what the Belgians call in foro interno, in foro externo, which means that if you have responsibility of something internally, then you have responsibility externally. This is particularly important in Belgium recently because they've just had another state reform, which is a round of devolution, which a lot of competences have been devolved to the regions and the language communities, and they automatically get the external consequences of that, which involves being represented in Europe, but it's also being represented in the OECD, the International Monetary Fund, the International Labour Organization, and international negotiations generally. Uh, this also includes economic matters that Eve referred to, which is the biggest driver because of this notion of competition that seems to have taken over the entire world, and it applies not only to states, but sub-state entities as well. Competition for investment, competition for technological advantage, but also partnerships with other places so that they can jointly work to improve their competitive advantage. The environment has become extremely important because this is something that cannot be contained within national or any other 
boundaries. It's also one of the kind of normative issues that Eve has referred to. Places try to demonstrate, whether it's stateless nations, cities or regions, uh, that they're good global citizens and that they can do more for the environment, despite the demands of competition. There's a big cultural element, especially in those places where there is a distinct language or the language is threatened. There's a political dimension, which is sometimes important in itself, and this shades into what is known as proto-diplomacy, that is, where there is a nationalist government in power preparing the way for maybe independence or at least constitutional change. This is the dominating theme at the moment in Catalonia, where they are, have been uh, making a lot of effort around the world, especially in Europe, to assert their right to have a referendum on independence and seeking recognition and external support for that. Uh, and then an area that's been of growing importance as well is international development, partnerships for international development and, and aid. Scotland has a small programme uh, in relation to this. The Basque country has a very large programme. Uh, th 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 those are the main things. Uh, they become more important as the world is internationalised, but in all cases they're running into serious resource constraints. In all the cases I've looked at recently, just updating the paper I did for a few years ago, shows that uh, all these sub-state governments have increasing ambitions and increasing international aspirations and responsibilities, uh, but fewer and fewer resources uh, to meet that, and so they're forced to make some very hard decisions about priorities. Dr. Keneally. I mean, I'd agree largely with everything that my sort of colleagues have said. I think the point that I'd add is that um, you know, a lot of these areas are, are, are linked. These, these drivers are quite linked. So the functional, um, I agree entirely with, 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 what, with what Eve said, which is I think the functional driver has historically been the main one in terms of boosting um, the economy, trade, FDI, and so on. But then if we think about the cultural side of sub-state diplomacy, obviously promoting your culture uh, has an element of promoting tourism and so on, and that then has a, a, a feedback into the more functional uh, economic side. Uh, likewise, oftentimes promoting your culture uh, is actually part of your political subnational diplomacy as well. These things can shade into each other. And the same on, on, on the normative front. So oftentimes you'll, you, well, you will find literature, academic literature, on sub-states who are looking to stand out as normatively different from the state in which they're, you know, the state of which they're a part. And obviously that has a, a, a political uh, dimension to it and the politics of difference between the, a subnational government and a national government can be quite, can be quite important. Um, so I think just to bear in mind the linkages between all the areas um, is important. A quick question then. You've mentioned lots of areas there that, that are the main drivers, cultural drivers, economic drivers, proto diplomacy in, in regards to Scotland and, and, and other what, what strengths do you think Scotland have in, in, in all of these things and, and what areas do you think are challenges? Do want to go, Eve? Well, one of the, the strengths that you'll see from my written evidence is that Scotland has something that I believe is quite exportable to the rest of the world, which is its democratic credentials. And, and I, I'm a comparative political scientist, so I, I work in lots of other countries, and, and I often find that many people are incredibly impressed by the, the, the peaceful constitutional negotiations that we've had in Scotland surrounding our future. And I don't think people within Scotland actually realise how well we've done in that respect. Um, to that end, I've been looking at various other countries that have had more of a normative or an ethical dimension to their foreign policy. The Åland Islands, for me, were particularly interesting um, because they have modelled themselves as the, 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 the kind of the model of conflict resolution, which they've been able to export around the world. They've been able to attract hundreds of foreign delegations to the Åland Islands to, to learn from them. Um, and they've also been able to tie that in with their other functional objectives as well in terms of building relationships relationships, economic relationships with places elsewhere. I think there's a, an opportunity for Scotland, especially given that we've had the eyes of the world on us for the last couple of years in the independence referendum to, 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 to galvanise that interest and to um, valorise our, our credentials as a, a place where we, we um, have a strong democratic process. Uh, the Constitutional Convention is something that I've spoken to colleagues in Tobago and Tibet about as a way of engaging civic society and, and 
and, and the public and in our politics. And also, obviously, we've had the, the highest level of, of uh, voter engagement in the referendum last year. A lot of people around the world are interested in how we're able to do that. I think that um, uh, basically advertising, <laughs> it would be a PR campaign advertising these democratic credentials would give us a focus for our other functional objectives and would be of interest to a lot of other countries around the world. Well, Scotland has the advantage of name recognition that is really important. And, of course, how we represent Scotland to the exterior is important as, as well because we're all familiar with some of the clichéd representations of Scotland that have been going around the world which need to be overcome. And there's a lot of effort going into presenting Scotland as a dynamic, modern outward-looking society. Uh, I agree with what Eve says about the democratic credentials and the exemplary nature of our referendum, which people in Scotland don't appreciate, but maybe when they pick themselves up off the floor and their bruises have healed, uh, they'll realise it was, it was done quite well compared with how these things are handled elsewhere or compared with what is going on in Spain at the moment. And if the Northern Ireland peace process can be exported around the world as it is, then I think Scotland has got an even better case to say these things can be resolved in a peaceful and democratic manner uh, and uh, in a way in which both sides accept the result. Scotland has also got a lot to offer by way of education because it has a distinct educational system that has many strengths. Uh, and there's always a danger in educational debates here that we become too parochial or we just compare ourselves with England. But if you put the Scottish education system in an international context, it's got a lot to learn uh, and a lot to teach. Uh, and I would emphasise this theme of, of learning, policy learning, which is an important element of power diplomacy, but is very rarely done effectively because it requires a long-term engagement and engagement of civil society as well as government and certain amount of resources going into that so we can improve our policy-making system, not only by learning from abroad, but also by engaging in a debate and showing maybe there's some things we can teach uh, others. There's also the question, uh, I'll come on to questions that are a little bit more problematic, of, of relations with the central government in power diplomacy. Now, in Scotland, these have tended to be, the referendum period apart, obviously, where there's a great deal of tension, tended to be uh, fairly cordial compared with other places and, and not a lot of big, obvious clashes. Uh, and there has been, again, until the referendum, quite a remarkable continuity in the main lines of Scottish external policy uh, between different governments or different coalitions. So there is a, a certain amount of consensus there, uh, but that does need to be worked on, and particularly uh, after the referendum, to make sure that there is a recognition of the position of Scotland without necessarily challenging the representation of the UK abroad. And the other big thing that Scotland really needs to do is to internationalise itself. It's all very well going abroad and talking to people abroad. Uh, but in Catalonia, for example, there's been a huge emphasis on the internationalisation and Europeanisation of Catalonia to make sure that society as a whole is informed about international relations and international opportunities. And this is something we don't do very well. We're just as bad at languages as other parts of the United Kingdom. There's not a deep involvement in Europe. There's a feeling in Scotland, well, Europe is somehow a good thing because it solves all kinds of problems for us, but not a deep engagement that I find in, in, in other places. So there's a lot of work to be done here in the education system, in business, in civil society generally by exposing us more to Europe, becoming part of Europe and international societies, and only in that way can we get more out of international linkages and international partnerships. Thank you. <clears throat> Dan. Yeah, I, I would agree certainly that in terms of what we went through <clears throat> in the referendum process, that is certainly something which we should make as much of as we possibly can in terms of exporting our knowledge um, there to other places. And I think the time now really is, 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 is now to do that. That will, that will fade if we don't strike while the iron's hot, I think. Um, I mean, other areas, just to add, uh, rather than to, to, to repeat what my colleagues have said, I think in areas, functional 
policy areas like energy and climate change, there's a tremendous amount of expertise and knowledge, uh, and we already see some evidence um, that, that that is um, translating in the Brussels setting in the, in the, in the, in the European Union context. Um, I also think a lot of the work that the Scottish third sector does uh, in human rights is, is certainly uh, something that, that is uh, exportable, and there may, be, uh, there may be other opportunities that currently aren't available to, to, to tap into international networks and international bodies in terms of human rights. I mean, that, that would probably be contingent on a change in the relationship between <clears throat> UK government, Scottish government, in terms of what Scottish government is sort of allowed to do, but you know, the potential certainly exists. I mean, if you, if you look at Quebec, for example, since the mid-70s, they've, they've played a relatively active role in what, what is now the UN Human Rights Council and what was previously the Commission, um, because they have, that, they have that opportunity that's available to them through their system. So I think human rights, I think energy, climate change, um, I think the cultural and creative sector, I don't, don't, don't just want to sort of get into doing a list, but in terms of things that are actual opportunities right here and now, uh, just to, to go back to what, to what Eve started with, absolutely the, the issue of constitutional change and how you handle that peacefully, but also Europe. Um, I mean, to me, as a um, you know, someone who is in support of, of, of the UK's membership of the European Union. Um, looking at the opinion evidence in Scotland, yes, there certainly does seem to be a difference in public attitudes towards European integration in Scotland, but it's not as dramatic as sometimes it's made out to be. And actually, Euroscepticism, softer forms of Euroscepticism, um, have grown over time in Scotland. Um, qu quite alarmingly, if you look at the shifts in the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey over maybe 10 or 15 years, the number of people who respond to the question, we should be trying to repatriate powers from Europe, has gone up really quite significantly. Uh, now, the perfectly legitimate position to agree with, um, but I'm just saying at the moment, I think there's an opportunity for, for the Scottish Government to articulate something quite different on Europe and really take up the role alongside others in, in, in the broader British political context of a champion of, of, of Britain's membership of the European Union. And that's, I think that's an opportunity for the here and now. I think it's an opportunity that will arise over the next few months following the general election as well, absolutely. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Convener, just to come in on this, this point, I'm really interested in this idea about Scotland <laughs> um, advertising or exporting our democratic <laughs> credentials and, and it's to get your, your thoughts on who, who's best to do that? Now, that may seem like a, a daft question, but should Europe do it? Should Scotland do it? Should Britain do it? And how should we do, we do it better? The example I can give you is that during my time on the audit committee here, we had several visits from countries, particularly in the Balkans, emerging democracies, for example, that had no systems of democratic scrutiny or accountability. Uh, and, and they were looking to countries like Scotland for assistance. Now, it tended to kind of stop there, though. There was a visit and we all had a good time and we shared some, 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 some time together for an hour or so, but that was it. It needs to be more than that, I would suggest, and I'm wondering what thoughts you might have about how we could extend that and reach out to countries like that to make sure that they do develop their democratic systems much more powerfully than they are at the moment. Um, thank you. That's a, a very good question. Um, I mean, one of the, the examples that I looked at a lot was the Orland Islands and how they went about exporting their model of, of being a place of conflict resolution. The Orland Islands, for those who don't know, are um, about 6,000 islands in the middle of the Baltic Sea and have been fought over by Sweden and Finland. Um, they were eventually granted autonomy to Finland um, under a League of Nations um, resolution 1920. But the Orland Islands are interesting because... Um, it was decided in the 1980s that they had to have a bigger international impact, but also that they had something to tell the world, something that the, the world could learn from. So it started off with the political parties themselves engaging in discussions to how to do that. They also involved a lot of civic society actors who also had a stake in seeing um, or promoting Holland as a place of conflict resolution. Um, for instance, I think Audit Scotland would be an important actor in contributing to debates about how Scotland could be advertised as a, as a, a bastion of democracy for other places that are undergoing similar kind of constitutional negotiations. Um, the Orland Islands then identified certain parts of the world that could potentially benefit from, from uh, their advice and support and invited them to the Orland Islands to, to learn more about their, their, their model and their process. 
Um, and in addition to that, importantly, they got the support from the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well, who also helped advertise this, um, this model to the rest of the world and their own foreign policies too. So as Michael was saying earlier, it's quite important to have um, good lines of cooperation with the central state government as well to advertise um, that kind of model. So in, in short, you need to engage a range of actors, political actors, but also civic society actors as well, in order to come to some sort of agreement on what this model might be and where you could best target it, what, what, what countries in the world could benefit most from this type of model. Yes, the, the problem with these kinds of initiatives is, is the follow through. As you say, you can have meetings and everybody says, let's meet again and nothing ever happens. You need to have some partnerships focused on things that are going to have some outcomes because people are not going to meet unless they can see there's something coming from it. It requires resources, not a huge amount of resources, but at a time when resources are very scarce, this is the easiest thing to cut, even though it's very important in the long run. At the political level, there are international linkages in, in which political parties tend to talk to their counterparts elsewhere rather than talking to people who disagree with them. So there are these networks, but they don't really come together. There's also uh, quite a lot of reticence because of the political sensitivity of many of these questions. Once you start talking about independence or self-government, whatever it might be, then uh, it, people become extremely defensive and so we don't have that conversation about creative ways of working our way through these kinds of things. This was apparent in the referendum here. It's a constant program, problem in, in, in Catalonia. When I go to Catalonia or when I'm somewhere else in Europe and the Catalans turn up, either the Spanish government is not there or there's somebody sitting in the back and taking notes and taking people's names. I never see them actually debating amongst themselves once they get outside of their own country. So we need to involve all levels in these kinds of debates, open up these kinds of debates at the political level. We have these wonderful debates at the academic level, but at the political level, you, you don't have that kind of learning. And so people tend to fall into rather rigid positions uh, and, 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 and simply promote these rather rigid positions uh, abroad. And then there's the way in which all these various things go together. Now, there's a disagreement in Scotland about whether we should become independent or not, but there's a huge amount of consensus about what kind of society we, we would want to be. Uh, and uh, I'm setting up a, a link with uh, an institution in the Basque Country. We had a little Skype conversation the other day about this in which they're promoting some notion of the Basque Country broadly around development, inclusive development, the social and environmental dimension of development and the way in which these ideas can be thought about internationally. Now, in their case, they've got a big problem, namely the association of the Basque Country with violence. Now, they've got a peace process, and they said beyond the peace process, now we want to think about things where we may be able to get some consensus uh, and we can show the world not just the peace process ending with violence, but how one can have uh, new ways of thinking about sustainable development at, at the sub-state level. Now, these things are not politically polarizing. These are areas in which we can think about learning and mixing and matching policies in, in, in different ways. Uh, and again, that's something I think Scotland will be very good at because we have had these debates, and our referendum debate wasn't just about independence, as it is in Catalonia. It was about what kind of Scotland there should be. Uh, and, and I think we should take those bits of the referendum debate and, 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 and ask ourselves, what are the implications of it? What kind of economic model do we want? What kind of social model we, can we do? What kinds of things we can do with, with what constellations of powers, whether it's independence or, or otherwise? So we've learned a huge amount. We've got a huge amount of data. We've had a very intense conversation, and I wouldn't like to lose it uh, just because the independence question is off the agenda for the moment, because there are other aspects of that debate that are really very important. <clears throat> Thank you and good morning. Um, Professor Keating, you, you said that we had a lot to do in terms of education and business. Um, we in Scotland um, launched a, a languages program for our young pupils in primary and secondary schools in a bid to try and enhance the, the skill level of our, our youngsters so that when they go on to university uh, and hopefully when they graduate, they will be able to acquire employment in Europe as well as work with European partners uh, almost on an equal footing. Is there something else that we're missing that you feel that we still need to do a lot on? And if so, what areas would you suggest that we need to 
perhaps concentrate more on? Well, there are international educational networks in which, which Scotland participates uh, and others where it doesn't get really involved because it doesn't have the resources, for example, in UNESCO or in the European higher education area, the so-called Bologna process, where Scotland has a kind of watching brief, but it's not really uh, thoroughly engaged in, the, in that. So it would require resources to participate. As far as the uh, languages are concerned, uh, yes, uh, the Scottish government has done things, the UK government has done things in England, the Welsh government has done things. Uh, it, doesn't, it just doesn't seem to work, and I don't know what we're missing there. Uh, but there is this very reluctance of uh, British people to learn European languages and, and to engage. And, and Eve and I were both at the European University Institute in Florence uh, for a while, and it was almost an embarrassment, <laughs> the, the, the lack of language capacity of British students. And they were the most linguistically capable of, of British students, and, and, and even they were, were, were frightened about learning languages. I think that takes a cultural change, and we've got to get rid of the idea that because everybody else speaks English, therefore we don't need to speak foreign languages. Because we can talk to them, but we can't hear what they're saying to each other. And we can't really understand the meaning of what they say unless we get into those languages. Now, there's a certain arrogance here and a certain laziness that really needs to be uh, overcome. And people have got to realize that learning languages uh, do does have rewards. Not only is it culturally enriching, but it is really important to be able to uh, operate in the vernacular languages of, of, of other countries. <clears throat> I I've talked to my colleagues in education about why this doesn't happen, and they don't know any more than I do about why it doesn't happen. Uh, another thing is, is, is uh, international exchanges, student exchanges, particularly student exchanges within Europe under the Erasmus and other European programs for student exchange. We get a lot of students coming here, but not a lot of students going, going out. And that really is a, a great pity as well, because they're losing out an enormous amount there. Uh, and so there should be greater incentives, greater encouragement for uh, Scottish students and indeed other British students, because it's as bad elsewhere, to go out and learn not just other languages, but other ways of thinking. This is critically important in business as well, because you go somewhere else and you do business. Yes, you're all working in a market economy, you're buying, selling things, but there are cultural assumptions about the way you do business that are really important to get into markets elsewhere. And sometimes we, we, we lose out on those opportunities because we don't understand that. Let me come back to you on that. I mean, You've touched on almost everything that we are doing in terms of encouraging language skills uh, amongst our student population. So if we are doing and if we are touching all the bases, what is it that's missing? Uh, now you're saying that uh, you know, yourself and that some of the academics are finding it difficult to explain the shortcomings that we've had, but those are historical. They're not, they're not uh, you know, for the future. I think what we are doing is dealing with issues so that when in the future we will be able to communicate better than we have done so historically. Do you still feel that we're, 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 we're cutting ourselves short or do you feel that the steps that, or the measures that we've taken to date hopefully uh, will go some way to addressing those issues? Well I think many of the policy measures uh, are there about teaching languages in schools. Unfortunately, the state of languages at the university level in Scotland is very poor because uh, of the emphasis on research and language departments very often don't do research. They teach languages, but so that's, that's not well regarded within universities. Universities are all competing with each other fiercely, so uh, they're all trying to get into the areas that attract more students and attract most resources. And so nowhere are there certain things being done. Certain things are just being left out, particularly uh, less used languages. So Slavic languages is, is, is one example, which is a very poor state in Scottish universities. That requires some leadership from the centre, whether it's government or the funding council, to say we need to have this capacity somewhere in Scotland and some universities got to do it and get the resources to do it. And then there's a problem more generally in society that the students should be surrounded by an environment in which this is appreciated. And this is a responsibility of, uh, of, of government, responsibility of the universities, it's a responsibility of business and, and everybody to say that this really matters and to present to young people the opportunities they will get if they pay attention to languages. Otherwise, they'll just do something else. So languages will 
they'll be available, but the opportunity simply won't be taken up unless the, there is a positive image and young people feel that they're get, going to get something uh, out of it, which the ones that do stick with languages do. Uh, but the message doesn't, doesn't necessarily get through because it's not reflected in the wider society. I think there's, there's a bit of work that this committee has done in scrutinising the 1 plus 2 languages um, uh, uh, policy, but work with the British Council, work with um, uh, Scott Goes uh, Global, which is the NUS project. You know, so there's, there's a bit of a supply chain going on there right now that, that maybe we're not uh, seeing the benefits of right now. So we, we're keeping a very close eye on that in this committee, and I can see from your point of view you are, you are as well. Um, Jamie McGregor. Um, when I first read the papers, uh, my immediate um, wish was to ask a question about para diplomacy and um, hard and soft power. Uh, when I got here this morning, I found a, uh, a letter from uh, Professor Keneally uh, d talking about the difference, uh, you know, or, or say, more or less explaining it. But I still want to ask questions on this. Um, can you tell us what the term para-diplomacy actually means, and can you provide examples of how para-diplomacy has been used successfully by sub-state governments in their international engagement policies? That's the first question. The second, really, is, again, can you <coughs> tell us what soft power means and its relevance to Scotland? And again, provide examples of successful uses of soft power and what the positive outcomes can be for sub-state governments who promote soft power. That's question number two. Uh, I hope they're clear enough, and I'm sorry if they're too broad. You promoted me to Professor Jamie. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, OK, I'm, I'll start with para diplomacy, and then maybe if I'm talking too long, somebody else can pick up on soft power. Um, para diplomacy, I, I think the simplest way to probably describe it, the most comprehensive way, is simply the involvement of sub-state governments in international affairs, the totality of what they do in terms of international policy. It's, it's, I, I find it quite an awkward academic phrase. I'm not really a fan of it as a phrase. I think it's, it's borders on jargon, which academics can sometimes like to use a little bit. Um, it's basically external policy of subnational uh, entities, and that could be a government such as the Scottish government, but it could also be, you know, UK, UK local authorities, which, which also have this sort of activity, US states, so on and so forth. I mean, examples of how it's been successful, I mean, um, Eve mentioned some actually earlier on in terms of um, is Bavaria that you mentioned, um, and certainly uh, several of the German, I mean, a lot of the German states have success stories here. So I was looking into um, Baden-Württemberg in terms of their renewable energy um, sector, and they've been able to really uh, set up an international kind of technological hub for that, really. And they've done that kind of through the power of attraction of a model that they, that they have and that they've developed and that they're knowledgeable in and can talk about with authority, which kind of shades us then into soft power, because soft power, um, as it's defined by Joseph Nye, who's the, the Harvard professor who really is at the, the, the center of that concept, um, he says that effectively soft power is the ability to, to attract people through persuasion, um, through the values of your system as such. So it's not about um, uh, compelling people to do things. It's not about uh, forcing people to do things. It's a form of power that is about attraction, that is about um, uh, persuasion. Um, and he looks at examples, for instance, in terms of the U.S. cultural sector. I mean, he looks at the... So a lot of his work is about U.S. power, and obviously you've got the military component of U.S. power, which is fairly well understood, uh, the economic component of, 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 of U.S. power, and then this third strand, which is kind of almost every, everything else, which is the power for the, things like the Hollywood film industry and the ability of that as a, to culturally export norms and to culturally export a, a way of life and a set of values and so on. Um, you know, the, the U.S. higher education education system in terms of its ability to attract in students, train them in a certain way, and then send them back around the world um, and to create networks who have been trained through your educational system and, and you can then tap into uh, for alumni and development and, and, and so on and so forth. So that, that, that category of soft power, as Joseph Nye looks at it, is really broad. I mean, 
I've just mentioned two, two instances in terms of US soft power, but, but there's so much more to it even than, than, than that. It's, it's a very broad category. But it's easy, e perhaps easiest to distinguishable from um, compelling people, whether that's through use of force, whether it's through sanctions, or even tying things to like um, you know, um, conditionality and trade agreements. So you'll often see states signing trade agreements with developing countries and saying, well, in order to have these concessions, you need to do such and such with human rights. You need to improve your government. I don't think, my understanding at least, is that wouldn't count as soft power because there's an element of compulsion. You're using the stick of trade concessions to get somebody to do something as opposed to effectively convincing them through the power of persuasion that uh, the outcome you want is the right outcome. That's... On, on, on the measures of success, it's extremely difficult to measure success, which is part of the problem of this whole uh, area and why it's very difficult to get resources into it because politicians want results in the short term, concrete results. This is long term uh, and when something works you don't quite know what it was that works uh, and what would have happened in, in the absence of that. Uh, we do know that it's important but it's very difficult to demonstrate in the short run but I can give you some examples. Uh, one of the best documented is the case of Quebec. In fact this is where this, this term paradiplomacy, this jargon term, came from looking at what was happening in Quebec and elsewhere in, in Canada, where it was an essential part of what was called the Quiet Revolution in the 1960s and 1970s, the modernization uh, of Quebec, uh, which involved creating uh, or dynamizing the, the business community in Quebec, becoming more internationalized, becoming more connected into international markets, inward investment and outward investment, uh, and an organization within the society as a whole to support this. Now, there was a political motive because the Quebecois at that time felt themselves somewhat marginalized and uh, a minority within uh, an overwhelmingly Anglophone North America. But there was a hard edge to it as well, which was about looking for business opportunities. And at some point, they, they started talking about Quebec Inc., Quebec Incorporated, which was a very unfortunate expression and has gone away thank heavens, but, but it did refer to something real, which was that when it comes to things that are identified as the interests of Quebec, people could come together despite the fact they disagree politically about, about other things. So there is that notion that we can sit around a table uh, and agree on certain things that are in the, uh, the, the common interest. Now, Scotland's got a little bit of that, but it's lost some of it since devolution because devolution has created political divisions within Scotland. Now, devolution is a thoroughly good thing. I'm not going to get me wrong. I, I've always supported it my entire life. Uh, but, but, but in the old days before devolution, it was very easy for us to say, well, we're all sticking together against that lot up there. Now we have to realize that we differ amongst ourselves uh, and we're maybe in danger of losing some of that common interest that, that is important. So it's the balance between our own internal divisions and projecting ourselves abroad that's quite important. And whenever I go to Quebec or read things there, I can see that they know how to play that game very well. And another example is in Catalonia, which has been extremely active in this field because until recently, the predominant political opinion in Catalonia has been in favor of some kind of advanced federalism, Devo Max or whatever, not until quite recently independence. Uh, and so there was a feeling, well, we can do certain kinds of things even within the existing constitution that we can agree about, uh, uh, even though independence may be supported by some kinds of, of people. So again, there was an element of consensus around certain things, even though differences about uh, other kinds of things. So, for example, Catalonia has adopted a policy of uh, two languages initially, Catalan and Spanish. That's become three languages. All children graduating from high school should be competent in Spanish, Catalan and English. It used to be French. English is now the international uh, language. Similarly, the business community in Catalonia, the business organization, the Fromente de Trabai, that's equivalent to the CBI, more or less, they're very strongly committed to the internationalization of Catalonia and facilitate in all kinds of ways inward investment and outward investment. So there's a two-way flow of investment and ideas in, in, in business. So to, again, uh, at the transition in the 1970s, Spanish industry was, was somewhat behind the rest of Europe. So this was about catching up with the rest of Europe, modernizing industry. 
Uh, and there's a political dimension to it, which has now become quite conflictual because the, there's an issue about independence and a disagreement about that. Uh, but, but until now, there's also been quite a consensus on the idea that whatever we think about the long-term merits of independence, there are certain things that we do agree upon uh, about getting Catalonia well connected in European and international networks. And they're extremely good at networking. They're extremely good at knowing the right place to go to and the right people to talk to in international organizations. And unlike the Brits, who tend to get on the Eurostar or the plane and come back after the meetings, the Catalans hang around in the evening. Uh, and that's important too, because there are those informal networks that are very important. Uh, that are important for exchange of ideas and exchange for influence. This is what soft power is about. It's not about forcing people to do things, it's about diffusing uh, ideas. Pardon? Sorry, who pays for the Catalans hanging around the evening? They have, they, they're not so puritanical and Calvinistic about entertainment budgets. <laughs> they're much more Mediterranean, and you eat well when you go there. But of course, there is a cost. Uh, there, there is a cost. Now, this, this can easily, of course, become junketing. Uh, but, but, but if it's well-focused and there is a purpose, then these informal networks are important. Yeah, thank you. OK. Um, Adam, did you want to come in on some of the points that Jamie's raised? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my uh, own take on this is obviously the, the generality of paradiplomatic activity that we undertake. <laughs> Is, uh, has a purpose to it in the sense that uh, we want to grow our soft power, our influence, if you like, over decision makers, particularly in policy areas that matter to us economically. For example, with renewable energy, uh, food and drink issues, those kind of things, where we'd be engaged with uh, other Europeans or people elsewhere uh, in the world. And a note from Dr Hepburn's uh, a written evidence that um, our paradiplomatic strategy has been criticised as ad hoc. And uh, as part of your answer to that, Dr Hepburn, you're suggesting that uh, we, we try to, if you like, uh, brand ourselves the Scottish model of democracy, which would cover all the, these kind of areas. Now, um, I don't see how one thing such as that can do all of that, to be perfectly frank. Shouldn't we have ad hoc paradiplomatic activity? Is, or are we not trying to um, get into all the nooks and crannies uh, that we can? <laughs> in terms of growing our influence uh, in the world so that people turn to, ah, well, I think we should um, have a, a wee chat with the Scots on that subject because they know all about renewable energy or those kind of things. And that, that's how you grow your influence. Um, and even in the academic world, so people such as yourselves, no doubt uh, people in Europe will give you a pick up the phone and give you a a call to ask about particular things. Is that not what we should be doing in a generality of things rather than focusing on one particular aspect of, of uh, our, you know, our experience? Thank you for that question. Perhaps I can clarify what I meant in my written evidence a little bit. Um, when I was talking about trying to develop and export a, a Scottish model of democracy, that didn't mean that it would um, subsume, sorry, take over or replace all of these other strategies that we need to focus on. And a lot of them have been identified recently by the Scottish Government and it's different narratives. So there's a, an economic narrative, an education narrative, a food and drink narrative and so on and so forth. I think all of these are, are very important to Scotland and they, they, all, they all should be given different degrees of weight depending on what our priorities are at different points in time. My point was merely that, um, that some of the most successful strategies of sub-state governments, who all have these different functional objectives, the Basque Country, Catalonia, the Quebec government, Bavaria, and so on and so forth, um, is to try and, and, and uh, present a narrative of their country of being somehow different, of having a niche in the world. 
So the way I was recommending creating a, a Scottish model was to develop a kind of an overarching narrative for all of these other functional narratives. Um, so, for instance, to take the, the issue of, of education that Michael brought up earlier, that could be linked to um, uh, um, a narrative about Scottish democracy. We could um, talk about our, our um, advances in education and public education, our influences throughout the world in terms of our higher education system. Um, it could link to be linked quite clearly to our, our, our education strategy. I think that a Scottish democratic model, in fact, could be linked to almost all of those strategies, but just to provide an overarching narrative in which to try and pursue these different functional objectives. Is that clear? Yes, uh, yeah, brief. I, th I think it depends what you mean by the, by ad hoc, and I think we need to sort out sort of a couple of different, not necessarily levels, but a couple of different spheres of activity. I think Eve's exactly right in what she just said, though, which is that that, that, that narrative, that democratic narrative, could potentially be embedded across all sorts of range, uh, or a whole range of, of, of specific policies that the Scottish Government then seeks to have influence on internationally. Um, somebody would need to coordinate that, and I don't know, I'm not you know, necessarily here to recommend who that would be, but I think somebody would have to coordinate that, that narrative and that message. And then I think your point about getting that out as broadly as possible and in as many different domains as possible, I think then I would agree with you that that's quite right. But in terms of specific public policy issues, international or transnational public policy issues, there I would disagree that it should be ad hoc. If there's one thing that the literature on not only paradiplomacy but also the literature on small states, and even though we, we had a certain outcome in September, I still think there's a lot that sub-states can learn from small states. Um, all of that literature points in the direction of prioritization and specialization and really pick in a handful of key things um, that you can really excel in. And, and that's simply back to this resource constraint, which is that you know, small states, sub-states do not have the resource in terms of foreign affairs that, that, that larger states have. And they have to prioritize um, because otherwise you end up with a policy that's sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. And then you know nobody's going to pick up the phone to you because you're not going to be seen as the expert on something. If you want to be in Brussels and you want to be right at the center for that policy community as the go-to person on renewables and energy, that takes years to build up those kind of networks and that kind of knowledge. And if you're diluting that by, by sort of running after everything that, that, that might come up on a given week, then I think you, you sort of undercut the strategy. So I think it, it depends what you mean by ad hoc. Um. Okay. The, the follow-up to that, that question really is, how can we measure the effectiveness of whatever strategy it is mm. we, we adopt? The notion of, of soft power influence, if you like, is um, it doesn't lend itself to to measurement, does it? Um, I mean, for example, can you give us some sort of indication of how has our soft power grown since we uh, uh, since devolution or not? I mean, we did have an office in Brussels before devolution. Um, uh, Scotland Europa office in Brussels before devolution. Are we getting more influence since devolution or not? Can you actually can you actually tell us that? Measure that? Uh, anecdotally, um, I, you hear when you talk to people at work in these policy areas and when you talk to people in Brussels, anecdotally, yes, you, you hear that, that Scotland is building quite quite credibly a reputation for itself in these key areas like energy, justice and home affairs as a portfolio in, in, in the EU. Um, in a sense, the four that have been prioritized by the Scottish government in the EU framework from 2009, but it is quite anecdotal. Now, in terms of harder forms of measurement of soft power, I mean, the Scottish government itself uses as one of its performance indicators the, the Anhalt Index, which looks at perception, the perception that other states have of of you um, as a state. And that measures you know, a whole range of things in terms of how easy it is to do business with you, quality of governance um, and institutions and so on. And Scotland, I mean, it was in the news last year, Scotland went down a few places, but it actually went up in terms of its, um, in terms of its overall score. Now, I'm quite skeptical that these kind of measures really tell you that much. It reminds me of the scene in Dead Poets Society where Robin Williams speaks to the kids about whether or not you can measure poetry. And then he asks them to tear the page out of the book because he thinks it's rubbish. And I, I kind of I have a similar sentiment to that. I think a better way of measuring um, success in this area, and I think it's something that the Scottish Government and the External Affairs 
team could, could, could do better, I don't want to be critical of them because I think they do you know, good work, um, but they could do better, is through real focused case studies. You have to sort of process trace this over a period of time. You know, we went to this meeting, we then saw this output, we, and you have to build up a compelling narrative and then it's for other people to accept whether that's A, persuasive or not, and B, justified by the resources that under, uh, a justification of the resources that underpin it. But to me, that's a, it's not quantifiable, but, um, and it takes time, and you have to pay people to do those kind of evaluations, but it is possible, you can, you can do it. But I don't think it's being done as well as it could be at the moment. Well, that, that public diplomacy is something not that sub-state governments don't just do. It's also state governments that have invested a lot of time and resources in, in public diplomacy as well. And that is to try and increase the international standing of the country on the world stage and to build up relationships and, and positive public um, reflections on that state. The US has invested a lot of time and resources and money into trying to evaluate its public diplomacy um, effectiveness. Um, it's got various ways of doing that. I had a look at one of their documents last night. Um, very difficult to do, as Dan said, but there are various ways you could do it qualitatively. Um, so, for instance, the US identified eight countries that were of importance to it. Then it conducted surveys, I think about 6,000 people, to try and evaluate how they perceived the US in various spheres. Another way of doing it could be quantitative uh, measuring, for instance, how many times um, Scotland is, is um, referenced positively in the, the social media. That's another way of doing it as well. But um, places like the US, the UK does it as well, have realised the importance of public diplomacy, but also in trying to measure in order to invest more resources where you're having a greater impact and that's of, of, of greater strategic priority. So I think what Dan said about identifying certain places, trying to build up a narrative to see if, if uh, how um, Scotland is perceived and how that has changed would be something that of value to the, the Scottish Parliament and the government. These points, but I'd make a more general point, and, and that is it's sometimes a mistake to prioritize policy objectives that you can measure. That's what got us into all this targetary business that's been such a bane for public policy. Sometimes you've just got to take uh, a gamble. Uh, and many of these things have intrinsic value anyway. It's good that students should be exposed to different cultures and different languages, whether, whether you can measure it or not. Uh, and uh, we think that it has positive economic benefits, but that may even be a side product. And the other point I'd want to make is that we don't really want to present a monolithic image of Scotland or a sensualist image of Scotland. This is a very pluralistic society. That's, that's one of its strengths. Uh, and we should uh, recognise that. And this is not at all in conflict with what Eve is saying, because we, we have different ways of handling our, our plurality and our differences. That's the Scottish model. It's not that we all think the same way. Of course we don't. It's that we have different ways of, of handling these democratic differences and these democratic debates. Uh, good morning. Um, how relevant are constitutional limitations on the activities of sub-state governments? Um, and what can we learn from experience, for example, in Germany as to the role of Bavaria compared to other lands? Well, uh, this is especially pertinent for, for European Union representation and the ability of sub-state governments to access decision-making at the European level and your, your constitutional status has a very strong bearing on the extent to which you can do that. So you mentioned Germany there, the Bavarian lender have a, a right, for instance, to, be, to represent the country in the, the Council of Ministers, as does um, Belgium and Austria and these are various other places, Belgium as well. Um, the Belgium constitution is probably one of the most progressive in terms of, of giving its sub-state governments um, international powers. Um, Michael said at the very start Start, um, this relationship between internal and external relations. Um, so that has enabled, for instance, Belgium, again a federal country, to write into the constitution that the, the regions in Belgium can represent Belgium and UNESCO and other international organisations as well. So clearly a written constitution, a federal constitution, often comes in quite handy um, to, to give uh, 
uh, constitutional rights to sub-state governments to represent themselves politically on the international scene. But when it comes to public diplomacy, that's quite different because that doesn't necessarily require constitutional levers or mechanisms to project the, the, the sub-state region across the world. And that's why a lot of sub-state governments have indeed focused on public diplomacy rather than other areas of hard diplomacy because they don't necessarily have the competence in those areas. Um, I'll stop there and pass it on to my colleagues. Uh, yes, as, as Eve says, the, the, the EU is, is critical because there are different arrangements in different countries, and Belgium and Germany stand out as being those that have a constitutionally entrenched right for regions to participate in the European Union. Elsewhere, it tends to be much more conflictual. Outside the European Union, there's been a lot of conflict in Canada about constitutional competences and treaty ratifications and so on, mostly but not entirely uh, affecting Quebec. It's also affected Alberta and some of the other provinces. In Spain, the regions, the autonomous communities are constantly coming up against constitutional limitations and a lot of these end up in the Supreme Court. In Belgium, there is this right to be represented externally corresponding to internal competences, but it poses a lot of difficulties, a lot of constitutional difficulties that, that, that are worked out. So it's a problem elsewhere. It's a less of a problem in the United Kingdom because of the nature of our constitution, the unwritten constitution and the flexibility of the constitution. And as far as Scotland is concerned, I think there are maybe some constitutional things that could be done, but much more important in Scotland is that Scotland should be properly organized and be present in the places where there is no constitutional obstacle to it being present, rather than focusing on the constitutional issues, which are not, I think, the major obstacle here. Okay. Dan, did you want to come in? Or you? Uh, just, uh, yeah, again, just very briefly, um, certainly, yeah, Germany uh, is, uh, well, I'm Belgian, but Germany is an example of, of, of a state where, you know, the, 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 the states, the state governments within it have really quite a lot of either powers or protections, both in terms of, you know, they have the power to conclude international treaties with the consent of the federal government, and they have the, you know, the right to represent their own interests at, at European, at Council, Council of the European Union, um, if, it's, if it's a devolved, you know, if it's a devolved competence. Uh, but they also have a right to be consulted on treaties that the that, that the Federal Republic signs if they impact on, on lender competences as well. And if, if they're not consulted appropriately or if one of the, the lender have a problem, then they will take the federal government to court. Um, and some people would say, well, that's not necessarily the best way to handle intergovernmental relations. We don't want to make them too litigious, but it seems to work there. Maybe that's just a difference of the German political culture to the British political culture, but it seems to work. Um, and then I think in terms of you know, issues like representation at council, for instance, um, keeping it in the European, you know, keep it in the European Union context. I've always thought that's a little bit of a red herring. I mean, I think it gets headlines when people uh, are able, you know, obviously it was a headline when the Cabinet Secretary for Education was able to present the UK government line um, uh, late last year. But I think the important thing is that Scottish interests are properly embedded in the UK EU decision making process before it gets to that point. I mean, that's really just the end point. You're in the room, you're tied to a negotiating line. The important thing is that Scottish interests are more firmly embedded in, in sort of FCO processes um, of determining what the UK line is. And there potentially is room for improvement in that area, but you know, who gets to speak at the council, I think less important. Okay, thank you. Okay, Anne. Convener and good morning, panel. Um, can I take us back? Um, my colleague Adam Ingram had mentioned earlier um, it's looking at specific country plans. Um, could you give um, some examples of how other sub state governments geographically focus their international engagement? Yes, the, 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 the most. Sub-state governments that are involved in this in recent years have produced plans. They've, they've all reorganized their system. They've appointed a department or agency with lead responsibility, sometimes under the first minister, sometimes under a, a designated minister for uh, external affairs. And there's been a sectoral focus and a geographical focus. So in Quebec, it's quite clear that the 
focus as far as cultural and language matters are concerned is France. The main focus for economic matters is the United States and the North American free trade area. And then they've got priorities, starting with Latin America as being an important area. The, the Francophonie, that is the French equivalent of the Commonwealth, important for language, but also important for trade relationships uh, as, as well. In Catalonia, the focus has been first on the European Union and then on Latin America for historical reasons, uh, and then opening up to Asia, because these places are all looking to Asia, uh, the future China and, and other Asian countries. Uh, so th this replaces a, what previously was a scattergun approach, whereby you just opportunistically go out and do bits and pieces everywhere. Nowadays, there's a much more of a strategic focus. Can, can I add an addition to that? Um, Michael is absolutely right that the, the, the geographical, later, geographical focus of sub-state governments depends a lot on historical and cultural linkages that that sub-state government might have. Um, but it might, also do to, uh, it might also have to do with political linkages as well. And I'm, I'm thinking about the Catalonia, which has established a, a public diplomacy council which is focused exclusively on public diplomacy. It's called Diplocat. Um, and it's been very active over the last few years, especially around the, the issue of the, the Catalan right to vote as well. Um, and I was invited to one of their events in Germany recently, so I had a good chat with them afterwards. Um, but they were surprised that Scotland didn't have the same number of offices in Europe, European cities, as they did. They thought that actually Scotland was way ahead of Catalonia in terms of having representation in Paris, in Berlin, um, in Madrid, um, and, and elsewhere in, in, in North America, and so on and so forth. Um, so they've had quite a successful strategy of targeting places, European capitals, as part of their proto-diplomacy strategy, as Michael said earlier, a strategy that that national, nationalist governments often pursue to, to increase awareness about um, plans for independence. Um, so they've launched various public events, had very high-profile talks in all of these different European cities. Um, they have also um, developed business networking through their diplocat, through their public diplomacy machine as well. So clearly there's economic functional objectives there that they're, they're meeting through public diplomacy. And they also have quite an interesting um, component on elections monitoring as well, which again I think has to do with their more ethical um, issue about the right to vote. Um, so they're, they're, they clearly have a very strategic and focused um, set of objectives for diplocat and they've been able to get them out across quite well in different European capitals. Okay, sorry, thanks, convener. Um, really to take you back to something that you'd mentioned there about the, the offices, the overseas offices, obviously but you kind of mentioned that we're missing a trick there and you know other, other countries have recognised that. How could we do that better? How does, could you give us examples of any other um, sub-states that, that do that better? Michael, yeah, in, in the paper that I did a, a while ago that you got, the, I list all the offices. Uh, Catalonia has a lot, <coughs> Quebec has a lot. There are different types of offices. Some of them have more of, of a political role, like the Quebec representation in Paris, and some are purely economic. Some in Catalonia and uh, Quebec are cultural, but this is to do la with language, which is not something that is so important uh, in Scotland. Every few years, a new government comes down and closes most of them down in, in all of these cases, because it's the first thing that goes in a crisis, uh, and then another government comes in and opens them up again. At the moment, Catalonia says they want to open up another 53. Uh, I think this is, I, I just looked it up the other day before coming here when the resources are available, where there's a terrible economic crisis and the resources are, are not going to be available. Uh, and then there are different kinds of offices. If you, if you take in Scottish Development International and Scottish presence in embassies abroad, Scotland actually has quite a lot of representative abroad. We don't have our own offices with, with a nameplate saying this is Scotland, except in, in Brussels, but elsewhere. Uh, but there is quite a lot going on there. So it depends on what we're trying to do with it. Now, in the case of Quebec and Catalonia, uh, there's a lot of this proto-diplomacy. It's saying, look, we are here. We are not part of the Spanish embassy. Or we have our own place here. Whereas in other cases, in the other Canadian provinces, for example, would be part of the Canadian embassy. But there'll still be somebody there. So the important thing is to have presence there. And in other cases, there are 
private entities, public-private entities uh, uh, that are linking, particularly important in, in, in business. Or in the Basque case, they've got, uh, they mobilize their diaspora. So they may not have a lot of offices in Central America, but there are an awful lot of Basques there, well-connected, who know who to talk to. So there are multiple ways of doing this. I think that is the, that is the trick, not just focusing on the formal office, but, but focusing on networks and how can you get to the right people, influence the right people, and how you can get these exchanges of ideas going. That's something that we've got to focus on more. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Please, we're, we're out of time, but I know that there's a couple of people wanted some very, very quick supplementaries. Um, I've got Willie and I've got Jamie, but if you can be really, really quick. <laughs> uh, well, it, it leads me quite nicely on to the issue about diaspora and how we reach out to the wider uh, community throughout the world. I mean, Scotland and, and probably Ireland as well. Uh, the number of people in, throughout the world claiming Scottish or Irish uh, ancestry is, is quite huge. And do you think we're doing enough to, to reach out to them? Because you, you described the Basque experience, uh, Professor Keating, has been a vital economic resource there. Do we regard our diaspora worldwide as a vital economic resource for Scotland? And how do we make that connection with them to try to develop it? We don't. And the, and the Basque case is, is almost unique because of this very strong sense of Basque identity carried by people uh, in, into, uh, across the world, uh, notably in South America, but also in, in North America as well. And there are historic reasons for that. Uh, there's been an effort in Catalonia to try and mobilize uh, the diaspora, uh, but for historic reasons, there are fewer Catalans abroad than there are uh, Basques. Uh, the Irish, and I was talking to somebody in Ireland, one of my colleagues who had looked at it, and they said, we didn't have a diaspora plan. We just stumbled upon it. We woke up one day and realized that we, there were all these Irish people, and many of them were important in, in, in business. Uh, but it, it, it is Im important, as, as long as it doesn't end up with this kind of cliched representation. We know what happened to Tartan Week a few years ago when it was hijacked by that guy Trent Lott who turned out to be a neo-confederalist with very demo, dubious credentials. So we've got to be careful that what we're representing when it comes to culture is a pluralistic Scotland, not one single vision uh, of Scotland. And, and it's become much better now. Things have improved enormously. It's much more professional. And we, we wouldn't fall into that kind of problem that we fell into with Trent Lott. It's quite important on, on the business side. Uh, I was in New York just a few weeks ago representing the University of, of, of Aberdeen, who are mobilizing not just Aberdeen graduates, but Scots and people with Aberdeen ancestry there in, in New York and in that part of the United States. Uh, on the business side, it's, 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 it seems to be less important because uh, the, the, there's a huge number of business people who could claim Scottish uh, heritage or, or ancestry, but, but they don't seem to be as conscious of this as, as in the case of, of, of some of the Irish. Uh, there, may, there may be a potential there as, as, as well. Um, as long as I say as it is recognised uh, that we're not trying to promote a single Scotland. We're trying to do other things. We, we, we're not just Scots all clubbing together against everybody else that this is part of a pluralistic approach to the world and, and, and that there may be people in the United States who have a very... I, I say the United States because that's where this kind of politics goes on. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen in other parts of the world. Uh, that, that, that could perhaps be mobilised more effectively. But as I say, it's something that would tend to happen spontaneously. If governments try to do it, then that's going to be a put-off. So maybe the business community itself should be taking the lead more there. Thank you. I just want to turn it around a little bit and not just talk about our relations with um, immigrants from Scotland, but also immigrants to Scotland as well, which I think should be an important part of any international strategy and which has economic, political and cultural ramifications for Scotland as well. Um, obviously, immigration is a strong part of the Scottish Government's economic plan, whereby there is a perceived need to increase immigration in order to meet our demographic and labour market requirements of having an ageing population. Um, the fact that Scotland actually wants to 
increased immigration makes it quite different from a lot of, a lot of other countries in, in, in Europe. And in fact, in terms of integrating immigrants when they arrive in Scotland, Scotland also has quite a different approach there. In fact, in contrast to England and many other countries, it has a far more multicultural approach to integrating immigrants when they arrive in Scotland. I think that's something that also could be shouted about in terms of developing an international strategy abroad that links in with this notion that of Scotland being a, quite a plural place, a, a diverse place, and a place that recognises and values different cultural contributions to our society as well. And I've done quite a, a lot of work on looking at the immigration strategies of sub-state governments, and I think there's a lot of potential and opportunity there for Scotland to, to develop that further, um, not only in trying to attract immigrants from certain um, places abroad, but also in terms of integrating those immigrants, even linking to the schools issue that Mr Malik was talking about earlier of developing a more multicultural um, curriculum as well in order to try and um, accommodate different ethnic and cultural backgrounds of, of, of our, our, our various citizens in Scotland. So I think there is a lot to do there as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jamie, has your point been covered or do you, do you still need... <laughs> very, very quickly then, because we're really running well, out Well, just in relation to what Dr Keneally... I'm sorry to demote you so quickly. Um, <laughs> said, said about... Uh, you know, uh, lack of resources sometimes and taking years to build up networks. Uh, do you think, is it easier sometimes for sub-states who already have the mother state's facilities in place uh, to, to interact um, with international organisations and gain international recognition than it is for small independent countries? Um, it's, that's back to the kind of well, that, that's that's back to the question of yeah, are you better as part of a larger unit or uh, by yourself? And I think you can kind of you can cut it both ways. Certainly, there are resource advantages that accrue to uh, you, you know a sub-state a sub-state region uh, that wants to work very much in partnership and in cooperation with a larger state where the policy is pushing in the same direction. Then then obviously an advantage will 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 accrue from being able to not piggyback that's not the right word but supplement and complement that that broader approach. The downside of that is that you're also then attached to the larger, partney, uh, the larger party when they're doing things that maybe aren't so popular in certain arenas. So you hear a lot at the moment in the House of Lords evidence that was published at report on Monday about this was that British influence is really struggling at the moment. It's on the wane in Brussels, and therefore you may get um, sort of a guilty by association reputation. So I think it cuts both ways. An example of that, um, Bavaria or Flanders, which have a lot of constitutional clout within their systems, would have far more impact on European policymaking than, say, Malta, which is a small state in the European Union. So to some extent, your constitutional status does not matter as much as the resources and capacity that you have to pursue I objectives. Get that. Yeah. Thank you. OK, we've went well over our time now because it's been an extremely uh, interesting and informative session for, for the work that, that we're doing. And, um, and uh, as you know, uh, uh, the, the other two uh, members of the panel, uh, Dr Hebron, will realise that when you have an engagement with this committee, we tend to not let you go very easily because you're, you're very interested in the work you're doing. So no doubt in the course of this um, inquiry, we will we'll come back to you for some of your wise words and, and certainly some of the ideas that you... You, you, you have um, brought up today are, are things maybe, you know, I've got Katie taking lots of notes on, on how we can pursue some of that as well. So can I say on behalf of the committee, thank you very, very much. Um, this is only the beginning of the work with you and then we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to go straight? Now, which is agenda item three. Um, if you could be really swift with any of your comments, questions or clarifications on. Willie. Thanks, Kavina. Um, see, on, on page nine of the report on youth unemployment, um, I mean, the, the bulletins are really good and helpful and informative, but I would like to see if possible we could have more of progress reporting with, with them. I mean, we know about the issues about youth unemployment and what they are and where they are and so on, but it would be really helpful, I think, to the committee if we could see some progress updates from time to time on how we're getting on. Ask for that, definitely. Any other comments? Questions, clarifications? Uh, Rod. Just on the, uh, the money laundering point, I was quite interested in, in the, the comments on the, uh, 
um, the progress of the fourth anti-money laundering directive and also just to draw to the attention that that will have an impact on us as individual MSPs if that passes. But, uh, more detail on that? Can do. Yeah. 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 Can we do that? Can we? Yeah. Okay. Committee agree to make the report, Brussels Bulletin report, available to other committees. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to suspend very, very briefly to allow for a very, very quick comfort break if you need it. Um, but to get the deputy first minister into the chair, I don't want to keep him waiting. So. Okay, welcome back to the uh, European and External Relations Committee. Um, agenda item four this morning is our inquiry on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, we are delighted to have with us this morning the Deputy First Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy um, to the committee. Um, and he is accompanied today by Richard Rollison, who we have uh, met before um, in this context, Richard, thank you very much for coming back to committee. Uh, welcome uh, to committee, Cabinet Secretary, and I believe you have an opening statement. I, I do, Kavir, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss what the Government considers to be a very important issue that the committee is examining and which uh, explores some of the significant public concern that has been set out uh, around a whole variety of issues on the uh, the, the, the TTIP agreement. Um, now this, it's important at the outset to put on record that neither the Scottish Government nor the Scottish Parliament has any formal role in the negotiation and ratification of international trade or investment agreements like TTIP. We propose such a role in our submission to the Smith Commission, but unfortunately that responsibility still lies with the European Commission, the European Parliament and individual member states. The Scottish Government's role, then, is to represent the people of Scotland and to make sure that the UK Government, as the Member State speaking for Scotland at the European Union, takes full account of Scottish priorities and concerns, whether those are economic um, or whether they are about devolved services such as the National Health Service. Um, as we speak, convener, the eighth round of EU-US negotiations is taking place in Brussels. Um, we will hear updates on that, but following Commissioner Malmström's decision to publish position papers and negotiating texts, uh, we have some further information about what has actually been negotiated as part of this process. I think we all would appreciate and accept that not every aspect of a negotiation can be undertaken in public, but there is a necessity, given the degree of concern that has been expressed by members of the public, 
that the process is as transparent as possible, and I would encourage the Commission to consider the EU Ombudsman's recent recommendations on this particular issue. I'd now like to turn to some of the specifics, which I think have been a common uh, thread in the discussions that the Committee has had so far on the economics of TTIP, the impact on the National Health Service and public services, and uh, the issue of investor-state dispute settlement. The Committee will have a, a note from my officials, which summarises the latest statistics from the Global Connections Survey on Scotland's exports to the United States. With £3.9 billion worth of exports in 2013, it is clear that, out with the European Union, the US is Scotland's single most important export market. It is also worth noting that, with 580 companies employing some 98,000 people, the US is our largest inward investor. TTIP provides an opportunity to build on that relationship. It could provide um, market access for Scottish goods and services and reduce non-tariff barriers. Um, if that delivers growth and jobs for Scotland, then it should be welcomed. Uh, however, we have to bear in mind, and the Committee has explored this issue, that the liberalisation of markets does not always mean that business activity is convenient for our side of the argument. It can then open up our markets, markets in just the same way as it opens up markets, markets to which we hope to gain access. And importantly, and this takes me on to my second point, um, that opening up of markets um, should not be undertaken in a way that compromises public services or the responsibility of government for public services. Um, over the last six months, the Scottish Government has pressed the both the United Kingdom Government and the European Commission to ensure that TTIP does not affect this Government's and this Parliament's ability to determine how and by whom the National Health Service and other publicly funded services are provided. We have written both to the United Kingdom Government and the Commission, and we have raised the issue at the Joint Ministerial Committee. And most recently, this was an issue that was discussed by the First Minister um, with the Prime Minister when they met in December. The, um, the, the, over the course of the last uh, few months, we have seen um, the, um, a number of reassurances given on the extent to which the the, 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 there will be protection for areas of the government's activities uh, where the government would be able to determine how and by whom services were delivered. Um, some reassurances have been given on this question, but I think it remains the case that until such time as we see the details of the agreement, we will not know whether these reassurances um, have any validity at all. I still take the view that the best way to lay our concerns and the public concerns is firstly to have an explicit exemption for the National Health Service on the face of the agreement, and, set, and secondly, absolute clarity that whilst the UK is the member state, any decisions it takes in the context of TTIP, like for example opening up the NHS in England to more private providers, in no way interferes with this government and this parliament's devolved responsibilities. The, uh, finally, can we let me turn to the issue of investor state dispute settlement, or ISDS. This is another area where we have expressed concerns to the UK Government, and in particular that ISDS may restrict the rights of governments to regulate in the public interest. I know that concern has been discussed by the Committee as well. The European Commission was right to consult on the issue, but clearly has some way to go over the coming months to convince people here and across Europe that ISDS is in the public's interest. The four questions identified by the Commission and which Mr Huben uh, highlighted to the Committee appear to hone in on the right issues, and I welcome Trade Commissioner Malmström's statement that the Commission, the Commission would never even consider an agreement which would limit the government's right to regulate. On this issue and on the issue about the National Health Service, although reassurances are being given, we will only have final clarity when we see the uh, detail of the agreement that is negotiated. Um, let me conclude, Convener, by saying that uh, the Government uh, believes in, um, in free and open trade, but we must take the greatest of care to ensure that the issues about which members of the public are rightly concerned on the question of compromising our ability to regulate or our ability to determine how the National Health Service should operate in our own country, it should not in any way be compromised by such agreements. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Deputy First Minister. It's, um, many of the aspects that you've, you've um, uh, touched on in your opening statement are, are many of the aspects that, that this committee have taken a keen 
uh, and deep interest, and especially on uh, public services um, and the ISDS mechanism. Um, certainly, uh, great concern raised here. A few weeks ago, as you mentioned, we had Hido Hubin, who was is the deputy chief negotiator on on TTIP. And, uh, um, on, at our committee, we interrupted in our committee because we were um, by video conference, um, it, which wasn't very successful in that case. But um, the success of that um, video conference that day was the information that, that, that we were able to extract from uh, um, Hiro Hubin that day. Um, and he seemed very, very clear that all of the concerns that people have um, with regards to TTIP are, are, are not they're unfounded and, and he was given all sorts of assurances but we couldn't really um, get an understanding of where those assurances would come from and in the, in the meantime we have um, um, Cecilia Malmstrom's letter to Lord Livingston which again you know sort of a backs up um, that position but doesn't give us the detail that, that we are looking for and especially on the NHS exemption he seemed to suggest that the NHS um, reservation. It would be a reservation that the UK government would seek from the trade agreement um, from Brussels. Um, he didn't seem to understand that the NHS in Scotland is run slightly differently and would we need to seek that reservation from the UK to seek from Brussels. There seemed to be an, uh, not much understanding on how that process would go. I wonder if from your end of things you have managed to work out or get any understanding of what that process would be as far as ensuring that public services, especially our NHS, was protected in Scotland. The first thing I'd say, Kavina, is that the government could not have made a clearer uh, statement or made clearer interventions that we in no way want to see um, the legitimate right of this parliament and under the auspices of parliament the authority of the government in any way questioned in our ability to determine how the National Health Service should operate or be structured or take forward the delivery of services in Scotland. We, that it, <coughs> we want there to be no restriction or no danger of restriction of our ability to act properly in exercising our devolved competence in that area. So if that's what we want to protect, to protect the existing arrangements that we can determine these choices democratically here in Scotland, then we must be absolutely certain that TTIP does not compromise that. And I think there's a sort of a, almost a double lock that's required there. Um, if the United Kingdom government, for example, was to uh, say that there should be an exemption written into the TTIP agreement um, for the NHS to be out with any possible scope of impact from TTIP, then we would also want to see uh, the devolved responsibilities of the Scottish Parliament respected within that process because there are, as we know, very different approaches being taken to the management and organisation of the health service in England compared to the way in which we are taking that forward in Scotland. So it's important that that double lock exists between uh, a protection at um, member state level of the United Kingdom, but also um, a protection for the, um, the, the devolved competence of the Scottish Government uh, acting uh, with the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Yes, that, that's where we were trying to get to as well, um, um, but, but not getting very far. We do have um, Lord Livingston in front of this committee at the next session uh, um, in two weeks' time, so, so hopefully we can um, investigate some of that with him. I'm going to open out to, to committee now, and I've got Jamie McGregor up first with some of the questions that you were interested yeah. in, Jamie. Thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, just in terms of the Scottish Government's current policy approach to TTIP, um, and I, I take it from, you, you know, your sort of optimistic approach, that, uh, which I would tend to agree with, that I, I see this as an opportunity. Uh, and uh, the, um, the convener mentioned um, the letters that we've had, which have been, uh, you, you know, giving support to the theory that this can't affect the, the National Health Service. Is the Scottish Government planning to make a statement about this? Um, in terms of, because a lot of MSPs I know are receiving letters, uh, you know, saying that this is going to be an, an issue, uh, and the NHS thing particularly is an issue, uh, and, and they all seem to be coming from 
one particular source, because they tend to be fairly similar. Uh, and and I, think, I think people are looking to the Scottish Government, perhaps for some sort of statement, as to whether or not uh, this, this, you know, the, the, the NHS thing is a problem, or if it isn't a problem. I, I, think, <clears throat> I, I think this gets perhaps to the number of the, the issues at stake here, Convener. Um, obviously, if, if Parliament wished the Government to make a statement on TTIP, we would happily make a statement to Parliament. Um, obviously, my appearance here in the Committee is designed to help the Committee's inquiry and to uh, contribute the thinking of the Government into the Committee's inquiry that's being undertaken. But if there was a, a desire for, the parliamentary statement, for a parliamentary statement, then the Government would happily um, agree to that. The, uh, Mr McGregor uh, asks me... Um, the extent to which the government, in such a statement, could provide reassurance that the NHS was not affected by TTIP. I, I wouldn't be able to give that on behalf of the government for the very reasons that I set out uh, to the convener in, my, in, in the committee in my opening statement, because although there are some reassurances coming our way, we won't have the answer to that question until such time as we see the concluded proposition that comes forward. And, um, that is why I think it's so important that the concerns that members of the public that are, are being expressed about the, the danger of um, a, a negative outcome uh, emerging for the National Health Service it continue to be expressed. And the Scottish Government will continue to express those views because we are you know, we're concerned about this until we see it absolutely in black and white that we have got that protection. The final point I'd make to, to Mr McGregor is, is, is this. The government, has, the government has nothing against trade agreements. Um, there's lots of trade agreements from which Scottish companies benefit and in which Scottish companies participate. But I would make two, two, two points about this. One is that we have to have our eyes opened about these things. Trade agreements go two ways. They, they may well open up opportunities for us, but they also potentially open up threats in our own markets. And we shouldn't view trade agreements as kind of dewy-eyed propositions that, um, that are just, you know, one-way opportunities for us all. Um, and the second point I would make is that um, the, the determination of these issues is absolutely a, a reliant on the wording and the terminology that is in the agreement, and, and I, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any visibility on that. I'm not sitting in the room doing the negotiations. So my, uh, any statement that I was given to Parliament on this question would necessarily be um, slightly uh, removed from the process of scrutiny, uh, the, pro the process of negotiation that is going on about TTIP. Well, thank you for that, <coughs> and uh, I agree with you, things have to be watertight, but um, can you tell us then how the Scottish Government has engaged with the European institutions and the UK Government on TTIP so far? Uh, who, for example, have you met with? Well, we've, uh, well, uh, we've met with um, a, the United Kingdom government to discuss this. It's been discussed at a number of ministerial meetings. It's been discussed at the highest level of government between the First Minister and the Prime Minister. Um, it's um, been discussed in a joint ministerial committee. If, uh, in joint ministerial committee, um, we've uh, made a number of. Uh, we've been in touch by writing to um, United Kingdom ministers on. A number of occasions. Uh, the uh, issue was first discussed at the Joint Ministerial Committee in Europe in March 2014, um, and uh, th those concerns have been uh, raised very directly um, with the UK Government, and there's been a number of official discussions into the bargain. Uh, we've, uh, we've also um, been in contact with the European Commission uh, about these questions, and we'll be happy to engage in further dialogue. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Adam. Adam Ingram. Um, no, just a quick, quick question to follow up on that. Does the Scottish Government have any role in approving TTIP? Is that out of your hands altogether? No, Okay. Thank you. Um, can I pick you up on the, on the point you were making that trade agreements aren't a one-way street? Um, 
Has the Scottish Government <coughs> or its agencies done any modelling of the economic impact of a trade agreement with, with the, the USA? We, we have um, undertaken some early modelling on the, uh, the, the, the possible impact uh, using the, uh, the government's uh, internal economic model. And what that, um, uh, that model is a computable general equilibrium model of Scotland, um, the CGE model. And what that early analysis shows, and again, this is, you know, I, I would, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to suggest to the committee more than that this is early modelling, suggests that the, the impact on um, our GDP in Scotland uh, could be in the range of an expansion of GDP to the extent of 0.2 to 0.3 per cent of GDP in a positive direction. Um, our estimation is that the range of um, export growth there could be, uh, could be between 1.8 and 3.6 per cent, uh, but the range of import uh, uh, expectations could be between 0.8 and 1.5 per cent. So, which, which is my point about this is not a one-way street. Um, so, there's a, th that's the early um, modelling that we've undertaken uh, on this issue. But obviously, um, that that's not with sight of all of the provisions of the agreement, but just of the you know looking at some of the indicative indications that would be the case. Uh, given given uh, those early indications, it would it would certainly seem that, um, and we, we got some similar type of uh, feedback from the European Commission, uh, European Commission people who are talking to that there are going to be winners and losers out of any trade agreement. Um, and I'd ask the question before whether we can see some benefits perhaps to the Scottish textiles industry where there are, there are certain um, uh, barriers uh, to Scottish exports to the USA in uh, goods, cashmere type goods and the like. So we could perhaps look forward to an increase um, in uh, employment and activity in the Scottish textiles sector. But on the other hand, for every job gained in uh, Scottish textiles, might we lose jobs in other sectors, say, for example, in food and drink, if we've got um, increased access to the European market from US producers whose standards of production are perhaps not as high as what we require in Europe. Um, have there been any, um, any modelling done in terms of the jobs impact of, um, of uh, any agreement? I, I, I would be... You know, the information I've shared with uh, the committee in response to, to, to Mr Ingram's earlier question is in, at the earliest stage of our economic modelling. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just noticing in my papers here, it tells me that I should... <laughs> I wish I'd read this bit first. <laughs> it said uh, that I should refer to this as indicative internal analysis. So I've now done it, uh, slightly in the wrong order, but uh, um, hey-ho. Um, so... I don't, I don't want to overstate the sophistication of that economic modelling. It is at a very early stage. I think to perhaps put some of the detail behind those estimates, um, I think the expectation would be that um, sectors such as the, the food and drink sector would perhaps benefit because some of the restrictions that may exist on imports into the United States, particularly around lamb products, for example, may be... Um, you know, these may assist Scottish producers in that respect. There may be some opportunities within the energy sector where um, the lifting of restrictions in the United States on exports of crude oil and associated um, uh, impacts on, on, on downstream activity might be beneficial, but I think that would be one of the, the areas where I think we could perhaps be 
exposed to as much uh, internal impact in Scotland of, uh, of the opening up of markets as we might gain in external markets. Um, so I, th I, think that, I don't think that's particularly clear cut. There may well be opportunities in, um, a, in access to US procurement contracts. Um, and then th the other areas um, you know, there might be opportunities in financial services, but then financial services are equally, you know, potentially uh, markets that could be accessible by um, external parties. So I think that that's that's some of the the thinking that lies behind those, uh, well, that uh, indicative internal analysis that we have undertaken on this question. Okay, can we sum it up as um, y you're approaching this? Um, the economic bent or analysis, the economic, and with some caution uh, as to the um, as to the impact of a trade agreement. You're not you're not expressing um, um, an absolute desire to see such an agreement uh, formed, or or not. What I'd say, well, the, the, the government, the government's the government's policy position is that we we believe in international trade. We encourage you know, a major part of the government economic strategy that we are going to, that we're currently revising, um, will end. You know, it will it will have a very big focus on the internationalisation of the company base of Scotland. So, um, at that level, the government is entirely supportive. Our agencies are involved in this process. We evangelise with the company base of Scotland about encouraging companies to be involved in exporting and international business activity. Uh, my point about TTIP. Is that we've got to? We've just got to be careful what we wish for, because until such time as we have clarity and certainty about the provisions within TTIP, um, there may be <coughs> just as many challenges for us as there may be opportunities. So I think so, Mr. Ingham's characterisation of my my view as being approaching this with caution, I think, would be a fair way to describe it. But reverting back to your first. Uh, answer. We really have to take what's given to us here. Is that is that correct? Because we we don't have any influence on the um, on any decision made by the <coughs> UK with regards to approving approving the uh, the uh, negotiated agreement or not. What I'd want to assure the I think I think in terms of uh, you know de jure. We will not be a signator, a signatory to this agreement. Um, so, in that respect, you will, we will not have the ability to <clears throat> finally control and determine its outcome. But I would want to reassure the committee that, at ministerial and at official level, we are making the strongest possible representations to the United Kingdom government, who will be involved in the process, uh, to ensure that there is the 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 widest understanding and acceptance of the interests of Scotland uh, within the UK negotiating position. Uh, so that's a constructive engagement. Um, my officials are actively involved in dialogue with officials from the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, and um, that's a, a perfectly open, participative conversation in which my officials are setting out the issues that matter to Scotland and encouraging the United Kingdom government to reflect those issues. And that's also been the basis of ministerial contact um, at the very highest level within the government. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> uh, I just follow on um, just with uh, some comments about kind of interaction with uh, people such as uh, Mr. Boyd from the STUC, who has very real concerns about the possible impact uh, on e inequality in Scotland uh, from some adverse impacts of such trade agreements. Obviously, I appreciate that the Scottish Government is not a signatory, but uh, can you assure us that you will kind of take on board and kind of uh, uh, discuss those kind of concerns with the STUC and others? Certainly, um, I, I've um, seen uh, a number of the comments Mr Campbell refers to, and uh, we have regular dialogue with the, the STUC on all of these questions, and um, I certainly would be happy to explore uh, further with the STUC some of these questions. Uh, the issue of um, 
of inequality is central to the government's agenda. Um, the tackling of inequality um, was at the centre of the programme for government that the First Minister set out in November, and it will be at the heart of what's well, at the heart of the budget that we discussed yesterday in Parliament, and it will be at the heart of the government economic strategy that emerges in due course. So I certainly would want to assure the committee that um, the, the, the government's focus on tackling inequality will be relentless. What we have to consider is what is the context and the circumstances within which we are doing that. And if that is exacerbated by the signing of TTIP, then what it will mean is that the government will redouble its efforts to, to tackle any negative consequences. Thank you. If I can, I'd just like to move on to the ISDS uh, situation now. As I understand it, obviously there are no current negotiations in relation to ISDS going on, and that was indeed the, the point of having the 150,000 uh, name consultation, uh, was to allow uh, the, the opportunity of, of, of testing public opinion throughout the, the European Union on that. I think possibly the, the response has uh, surprised the Commission and we're now in the period, as I understand it, where the four questions which you identified are being uh, discussed further uh, with stakeholders. Um, obviously, there are issues and there's been assurances that states' right to regulate will not be affected and there are discussions about the format of the arbitral tribunals and openness on that. And it's suggested that a lot could be gained from looking at the... Uh, trade agreement with Canada, which has not yet been ratified. Uh, what I wanted to know whether the, the Scottish Government had any particular view on the state of play with the, the, the ISDS at the moment, and whether the Scottish Government would be in, in any way involved in uh, any consideration as to the impact on domestic judicial systems, which I think is the third question. I raised that with uh, Mr. Huben. He suggested that Scotland's uh, separate legal system, and perhaps I ought to refer to my register of interest at that point, as a member of the Faculty of Advocates, would, uh, would be engaged. But uh, I just wondered if you had any kind of general comments on where we are with IESDS at the moment. Uh, my, my sense, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm a, an observer in this process, so my, my comments are, are, are from that perspective. My, my sense is that I think the the ISDS element of uh, TTIP um, is probably retreating because I think the, it's just becoming unacceptable. I think that's, I think that's quite clear. If you, I was struck by the, the European Commission on the 13th of January said um, that it would never even consider an agreement which would lower our standards or limit our government's right to regulate. Neither would EU member states nor the European Parliament, which I think I, I take from that a, 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 quite a suggestion that the type of um, you know, the ISDS argument is now in a very different position to where it was six or 12 months ago. And that's been a product of public concern and public pressure. And I would signal to the public that this is the moment to continue to apply that pressure to ensure that we get this to the right place. Because to answer Mr Campbell's fundamental question, I'm, I, I, I don't see the necessity for um, a process under the invest, investor state dispute settlement arrangements because I think that would contradict or undermine the established systems of law within individual jurisdictions. And I don't want in any way to see the ability of the Scottish jurisdiction to determine issues in terms of uh, the law of Scotland um, in this respect. Thank you. So, a quick comment on that one, Cabinet Secretary. I think maybe even just in the last week the ISDS argument has shifted a bit further when the Greek finance minister said that Greece would veto TTIP if the ISDS mechanism stayed within it. I think they would veto it on other areas as well, but um, just you know, looking at that sort of a harder line that, that one member state has taken, whether that will be um, you know, an opportunity for other member states to come in behind that. So you're not just getting the public opinion, you're then getting the, the geopolitical opinion on that as well. Um, yes, I think, I, I don't think this uh, concern 
is, is just held within the Greek government. Um, I was interested um, to see comments which were expressed in a joint statement between the governments of France and Germany um, asking the Commission to examine, and I quote, all the options for modifying, close quotes, the ISDS clause. So I think there's a, I, I get the sense, and I think it would be really beneficial for the United Kingdom government to be part of this movement within Europe to express um, opposition to the ISDS provisions, because the, uh, you know, I think the, you know, Mr. Campbell raised the, the impact that they could have on our own domestic jurisdiction, and I, I want to be absolutely clear with the committee that I don't want to see that happening. Thank you. Anne McTaggart. And good morning, Cabinet Secretary. It's really just um, to go back on a question about what kind of work has the Scottish Government or its agencies um, done to raise awareness about the potential opportunities for SMEs? I think the, the I think I'd like to answer that in, in two respects. One is that we are actively involved through the work of Scottish Enterprise, Hands Hands Enterprise and Scottish Development International on encouraging Scottish companies to trade internationally. So a major part of the dialogue that goes on between our agencies and the company base of Scotland is to encourage more companies to be exporters. And I, and I you know, very clear on this point, I, I, um, I would love to see a broader range of companies in Scotland participating in international business activity. We're seeing the Global Connection Survey, which is very encouraging about the degree to which that is, that is happening, but I'd like to see more of it. So we, we do take forward that work very actively with the company base through all of our existing channels. And interestingly, amongst the... I, I notice a, a fundamental difference in the New Start business community in Scotland from when I worked in that sector 25 years ago and when Mr Ingram was in a similar area of activity. Um, you know, small emerging start-up companies at that stage in the late 80s, early 90s were unlikely to think of themselves as international business players. But digital connectivity has completely changed that. So. My experience of the new start business community today is you know, these individuals start up their business, they have a smartphone and they think, well, <laughs> here is my access to the world in my smartphone. And they think of themselves almost automatically as international businesses. And that's, that's very welcome. And I would want to, and our concerns about TTIP, I would not in any way want to undermine that encouragement to the SME sector to be actively involved in international business activity. So that's the, that's the dialogue that takes place with companies to encourage their export. And the other part of my answer to Mr McTaggart's question is that um, I, I, I don't think we can properly um, prepare the business community for TTIP until we know what TTIP is going to be about. So it's a bit uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of question. That um, so so that would that would determine exactly how best. But you know, notwithstanding our need for clarity on TTIP, we will still continue to support companies through our enterprise networks to be involved in international business activity. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Very much, Gonzalo Malik. Uh, thank you very much, Captain Secretary. Um, welcome to our committee. Um, uh, first of all, I want to mention a couple of comments you've made uh, before I actually pose my question. You said that the First Minister and the Prime Minister have had discussions on TTIP, which is very encouraging for me because it means that there is a dialogue being established. But then you go on, and I quote when you say, uh, in terms of the inference, you say none whatsoever. That then sort of disappoints me a little because if the First Minister has been speaking to the Prime Minister, that obviously we have some influence perhaps none whatsoever, maybe uh, uh, not quite true. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to correct you there, because the, the question I answered from Mr Ingram was whether or not we would be a signatory to uh, it was TTIP. Before, it was before that, but I won't split hairs. I'm certainly quite happy to, to, to reaffirm right. that our dialogue is with the United Kingdom Government and with the Commission, and we put that uh, forward as assiduously as we possibly can do at the highest level in government. But I think as a matter of fact, um, we will not be a signatory to TTIP. Yeah. 
well, that, that's another issue. But the, the point that I wanted to raise with you after these two comments was that the U.S. has a disproportionate power in extraditing people from the U.K. to the U.S. If, and when they need to, uh, compared to the U.K. And I'm wondering with TTIP, are we going to be able to protect our business community better than that, or is it going to be status quo, uh, or are we having any discussions to try and redress that in any way? I think that gets to the, 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 the ground that I was dealing with in my answer to, to, to Mr Ingram earlier, that um, nobody should view trade agreements as a one-way street. You know, if, if, if somebody else's market is getting opened up for us to go to, then our market is getting opened for somebody else to come to. And Mr Malik's observations about um, the, um, the strength and the effectiveness of the United States and the disproportionate influence that can be exercised, these are, these are, these are of course, comments of fact, um, given the, 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 you know, the, the scale of the United States and the, um, the strength and the power of its economy. So I, I think that you know, we, should have, we should have our eyes wide open about this. Yeah, but I'm, uh, I was hoping that um, you, would may, you may consider um, looking at the possibility of trying to narrow that influential gap uh, so that uh, our business people won't feel vulnerable. I think it's important that uh, when we're encouraging business, and uh, I mean, I have, uh, I'm very pleased with the, the process and the engagement that we have with the US, and in particular, I'm pleased with the growing trade that we do have with them without TTIP. Uh, with this, so I'm hoping that we will have more business with them, but at the same time, I'm, I'm also very keen to protect our citizens and yeah. their rights. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I think that's a, that's a point I accept entirely, and it's important that we protect uh, our citizens, we protect their rights, we protect their um, their opportunities and their liberties, and, and that's a, an important value the government supports. Thank you. Molly Coffey. Thanks very much, Good morning. Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if I could uh, return to the issue about where the power really lies in relation to TTIP and specifically in providing access or potentially providing access to Scotland's NHS. Uh, some people are certainly saying that it's the evil European Union who can provide access to Scotland's NHS through TTIP. But at a previous committee, we heard um, Ariana Andriangeli telling us that it's not through TTIP that the power of the member states to decide whether to provide health care services through the market is. It's because the EU simply has no power unless the member state confers that power on it. Firstly, does the Scottish Government agree with that? And secondly, does that therefore mean that it's the UK Government that ultimately has power to decide this matter? I, it's difficult for me to give a, a precise answer to, to Mr Coffey's question about what, what might or might not be the interpretation of the, of the treaty, because I, you know, it's not been agreed and, I, and, I, and I, I don't have sight of it. I think what's important is that I set out what we believe and what we consider to be appropriate in all of this. And what we believe is that there should be nothing arising out of TTIP that restricts the ability of this Parliament and, by extension, the Scottish Government to be able to exercise our democratic right to organise the National Health Service in whatever fashion we decide democratically to be appropriate for us. So there should be nothing in TTIP that um, compromises that existing democratic right that we have here in Scotland. And as I think I said in my earlier remarks, the, 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 the simplest and clearest way of doing that is to put that exemption, that exception, absolutely central to the drafting of TTIP so that it's just, it's just beyond question. And that would be the clearest way of doing that. And in the various correspondence that you've mentioned with the UK Government and the Commission, have you gotten anywhere near uh, those kind of guarantees and reassurances that, that you're seeking? We, we, we certainly um, we, we don't have a guarantee that such an exemption would be there. Um, we've argued for that, and I would say that 
that's met um, a reasonably sympathetic welcome within the UK government, but I don't know where we've uh, where we've reached on the um, a, where on the where we will reach on the final uh, negotiation of that point. Ultimately, if if the UK government did decide to go down this route and support this provision within TTIP, and by that I mean actually providing access to UK NHS services from the United States, will that, or will that have a consequential impact on Scotland by default if, if they made such an agreement? That, that's that's, that, that's a, a point that um, we have to be very careful about, That and, and that's why I'm, I advanced the argument to the convener earlier of the, of the double lock, that we actually um, have a situation where the particular rights and responsibilities that are enshrined in the devolved settlement are, are, are taken into account in the position that is uh, reflected by the United Kingdom government. And ultimately, these questions will only be answered by any final agreement that is reached. But I do think making sure that that issue is resolved in a fashion that gives us the maximum protection for uh, our National Health Service and the maximum protection will be delivered by exempting National Health Service from the scope of uh, this, uh, this agreement. It would be the clearest way of enabling that to be the case. Just finally, supposing though that Perhaps supposing the UK government were to negotiate this deal and think that it was perhaps saving in terms of its own spend on the NHS, say, £10 billion, would that not have a, an automatic consequential effect on a budgetary settlement for Scotland or would we still um, be expecting to receive the same amount? Well, the way the, the, way the, the, way the Barnett formula operates um, is that um, if expenditure in England on the health service rises by um, £10, expenditure in Scotland rises by one. If expenditure in England falls by £10, it falls by one pound in Scotland in terms of the application of the Barnett consequentials. So the scenario that Mr Coffey paints of um, a rising amount of contribution to the health service budget in England coming from non-public sources resulting in a decline in public spending on the health service in England will have an effect on the Scottish budget. It absolutely will have an effect on the Scottish budget. Any further questions from committee members? Rod Campbell. I don't know whether <coughs> Cabinet Secretary whether you want to say anything generally about the impact of TTIP on regulatory standards. Um, let's see... Uh, some of when we had heard from representatives of the business community, a lot of that evidence was focused that uh, the impact on regulation might be of greater significance than actually reduction in tariffs. But um, that's quite. The, you know, there is there is regulation is in place to deliver um, good and positive outcomes in a number of different respects. And if an argument is to be advanced for the removal of regulation, it has to be on a, on a, on a sound basis. And you know, this government has taken away different aspects of regulation at different times um, where it's been justifiable to do so. Um, but for example, if there was to be any erosion of um, some of the quality of food standards, for example, I think people would be that were required by TTIP, people would be understandably horrified by that, given what the journey we've been through as a country about the quality of food. And you know, the farming interests that I represent, who excel in the quality of produce that they generate, often are saying to me, where's the level playing field that we operate to this particular level of regulation within Scotland in the in the, the care and well-being of livestock. Um, when we can present this product in a supermarket, and there's one presented next door to it, which has come from a lesser regulated scenario. And I've got every sympathy 
with my farming constituents that put that point to me. Every sympathy with them. So I think we've got... So your regulation has its purpose because it assures us on a whole host of areas where our confidence has been weakened by poor experiences, and we all can think of examples where that's the case. So in no way would I want to see TTIP um, in any way um, undermining the ability of us to assure our citizens that we have proper and effective regulation in place. Okay. Okay. Jamie, did you want to well, ask a specific question about you, a specific I, I food stuff? I agree stuff. with what you yes. <laughs> uh, Just on, on the food and drink thing, which is so important to Scotland, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, <coughs> sort of businesses like Scotch lamb and Stornoway black pudding and those sort of things which may not seem you know, world-shattering importance, but they are very important to certain areas of Scotland. Um, can there be a sort of guarantee given uh, through that TTIP will not um, uh, uh, adversely affect um, th these products? I, I would certainly... Um, I think it would be a, a, a very real mistake if TTIP was to reduce... Um, regulatory assurance around food safety standards. I think that would be that would just open up another concern about TTIP if that was to be the case. Um, so I would be very anxious to ensure that um, the ability of uh, individual jurisdictions to in, uh, to take forward um, the, um, the, the 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 proper approach on food safety was assured. Okay. Thank you. So protect the stone away black pudding, Jamie. Yeah. Delicious. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Cabinet Secretary, we have exhausted our questions for you th th this morning. Can we thank you very much for, for coming along? You'll understand that our committee inquiry is continuing. We, we have to um, say to you that we've had a, a huge interest via social media in this topic with people actually offering questions and some of the questions that that came along today came from some of those sources. So um, a, a real 21st century committee in Parliament in operation. And we're looking forward very much to the, uh, the um, evidence from Lord Livingston, who I think will, will hopefully fill some of the gaps that, that, that we have identified through your evidence and the evidence that we've taken thus far. So thank you very, very much for informing us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you back at committee another time. Thank you. OK, I'm going to suspend now and we're going to go into private to deal with agenda item five. <laughs>